Hello. In this video, we'll look at the Heathkit HW8, a QRP amateur radio transmitter. We'll look at the history of this radio, its features, and take a look at it inside and out. I'll discuss the restoration of this particular unit, and we'll demonstrate it being operated for transmitting and receiving. Heathkit was the most well-known manufacturer of electronics in kit form. A large part of their product line was amateur radio equipment. Heathkit offered a wide range of equipment in various price ranges. By the late 1970s, QRP, the challenge of communicating over amateur radio using low power transmitters, was becoming popular. Heathkit got into this market in 1972 by introducing the HW7 QRP transceiver. The HW7 had a number of problems and limitations. The HW8 that we'll look at here was the successor to the HW7 that addressed many of these issues. In 1984 it was replaced by the HW9 which offered more bands and more output power, although it was never as popular as the HW8. The HW8 is a QRP transceiver covering the 80, 40, 20, and 15 meter amateur radio bands with coverage of the first 250 kilohertz on each band. It was manufactured from 1976 to 1983. It sold initially for about 140 US dollars. My 1982 Canadian Heathkit catalog lists it in Canadian dollars at 289.95, a little pricey as this would be equivalent to 600 to 700 dollars today. It had a similar look to the earlier HW7, but was a different design internally. It's in the two-tone green style like other Heathkit gear. The later HW9 adopted the brown style of the late model Heathkit ham radio products. It's a direct conversion receiver that can receive CW, Morse code, and single sideband signals, but not AM. It's all solid state, utilizing 14 transistors and two integrated circuits. An active audio filter offers selectivity of 750 hertz in the wide setting and 375 hertz when set to narrow. Sensitivity is rated at 0.2 microvolts. Tuning has a vernier dial. No speaker is provided. It drives headphones. It can transmit in CW mode only and power varies from 3.5 to 2 watts depending on the band. The transmitter is VFO controlled. There's a transmit side tone with adjustable volume. While not true break-in, Heathkit called it semi-break-in, there are no switches to throw to switch to transmit, just keying. It uses a relay and has an adjustable transmit receive delay. The unit needs an external 12-volt power supply. Heathkit offered the HWA-71 as the official one. If you've only seen pictures of it, you may not realize just how small it is in real life. Not much bigger than a book, it's nine and a quarter inches wide, four and a quarter inches high, and eight and a half inches deep and weighs about four pounds. This makes it suitable for portable operation. You can easily carry it around and run it off of battery power like a car battery or a gel cell. The kit came with the usual excellent Heathkit assembly manual. It included a large schematic, block diagram, and fold out assembly drawings. Alignment requires a reference receiver and vacuum tube voltmeter and preferably an accurate signal generator. It even came with two alignment tools and a dummy load. Let's take a look at the front panel. Here we have power and AF gain. RF gain is on a concentric shaft. I find that it's easy to inadvertently turn both gain controls at the same time. You tend to need to use the RF gain on strong signals as there's no automatic gain control. There's a pre-selector control with approximate marks for each band. This needs more frequent adjustment on the lower bands, especially 80 meters. Tuning utilizes the dial with a 6 to 1 vernier. Dial indicators of 0 to 250 correspond to the first 250 kilohertz of each of the four bands. You need to add the starting frequency of the band to the dial reading, i.e. 3.5, 7, 14, or 21 megahertz. The dial has a pretty good feel to it. It's a little tricky to tune single sideband signals. 
Because it's a direct conversion receiver, you'll hear a signal on both sides of the center frequency. You need to use the upper frequency to ensure that you're transmitting on the center frequency. The manual suggests that you tune the band from high to low. Selectivity controls the active audio filter with wide and narrow settings. Narrow is good if there's interference from stations near in frequency to the one you're trying to listen to. Loading is adjusted during transmit to match the antenna as indicated by a peak on the meter. The meter's for indicating relative output power and is not calibrated. It's not a receive S meter, although there are mods for this. There are four push buttons for band switching. Switching is solid state and mostly done using diodes. On the rear panel, we have 12 volt power. This uses a non-standard connector and cable. So if you're purchasing an HW8, check if it comes with the cable. If you use the Heathkit power supply, it's specced at 13.4 volts, but it can run from anything from 11 to 16 volts and needs at least 430 milliamps on transmit. The antenna connector is on an RCA phono jack. These are often changed to an SO239 type connector. Headphones on, are on a quarter inch phono jack. Note that this is mono. If you want to use stereo headphones, this is somewhat problematic. You can replace it with a stereo plug, but be careful as the sleeve is grounded to the case. I use a quarter inch mono to 3.5 millimeter stereo adapter. The radio calls for high impedance headphones, approximately 1,000 ohms, but I found that lower impedance ones, about 50 ohms or more, were fine. It will not drive a speaker directly, but you can use amplified PC type speakers. The code key is on a quarter inch phone jack. It should work with most keyers. There's wiring options depending on whether you want a straight key or a keyer set up for grid block keying. Be careful when plugging the code key and headphones in as they use the same size jack and connector. Uh, you can inver inadvertently reverse them if you plug them into the back. The other day I was puzzled for a few moments why the receiver wasn't working until I realized that the headphones were plugged into the key jack. Removing the top cover You can see that most of the circuitry is on a single-sided printed circuit board. There's a small second PCB for the auto amplifier and some point-to-point -point wiring to the front end, rear panel controls, and connectors. There are internal trimmer pots for setting the transmit receive delay and side tone volume. Note the use of toroid inductors which I imagine was a relatively new innovation at the time this radio was made and not seen on older equipment. Assembly did not require the kit builder to wind any of the toroids. The HW8 was very popular. Its main advantages were its small size and suitability for portable operation. It's easy to operate, VFO controlled, and offers multiple band coverage. It's quite sensitive and stable. The main limitations are that the transmit and receive frequencies have a fixed offset. There's no S meter and no automatic gain control or noise limiter. The output power is not adjustable and is a little on the low side. There's no speaker and no dial or meter lighting, although this saves battery power. Finally, it's lacking support for some bands and has no crystal calibrator. Many of these limitations are addressed by the various modifications for the radio that have been published. Some people have claimed that the HW8 is the most modified rig in ham radio history. The HW8 Handbook is a book that was published of HW8 modifications and articles, and it went through four editions. It also covers the HW7 and HW9. You can still purchase an electronic version.
I had been looking for a transceiver in the Heathkit HW QRP series to round out my collection of Heathkit amateur radio equipment, and I settled on looking for an HW8. This particular unit was acquired on eBay. It looked in very good shape, unmodified, and was reported as testing and working. When it arrived, I was not disappointed. It came with the original manual and even the original box. Interestingly, while it came from Phoenix, Arizona, the box indicated that it was from the Heath Company store in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. That's where I grew up and started my ham activity. I made many visits to that Heathkit store admiring the ham radio, computer, and other kits, and my first station was made up of used Heathkit equipment. The radio is very clean and has had no modifications done to it. It seemed to be basically working out of the box. It included the original manual with fold-out schematic and pictorial pages. It even came with one of the two original plastic alignment tools. According to a handwritten note in the manual, some of the front end toroid coils were assembled incorrectly in the wrong locations. Looking at the assembly manual on the radio confirmed it. It also appeared to be not quite as sensitive on the 3.5 and 7 MHz bands as it should be. I removed the toroids, which was quite a job as the printed circuit board needed to be partially removed to get at them, and reinstalled the coils correctly. Someone had also installed an extra capacitor on the bottom of the PCB across the 40 meter trimmer cap to compensate for the inductance of the wrong coil. I removed that too. The mystery is, who figured out that the toroids were wrong? The original builder or someone later? Kudos to whoever figured it out, but why didn't they fix it? Anyway, after 30 plus years, the radio is now working as it should. After the fixes and doing a full alignment, it seems quite sensitive on all bands. It's quite selective when set to narrow selectivity, good for situations when there are several nearby CW stations being received. It's simple to operate, and while it isn't full break-in, it is pretty close. Let's take a look at operation starting with transmitting. I'm using a dummy load here to avoid interfering with other stations on the air. To operate it, you select the band and set the frequency on the dial. Key the transmitter and adjust the loading control for a peak. You're now ready to go. When transmitting, the TR relay clicks over and you can hear the side tone in the headphones or speakers as I'm using here. With semi break-in, you can receive when you stop keying according to the adjustable TR delay. I'm getting two or three watts of output power into a dummy load depending on the band used. To demonstrate receiving, I've hooked it up to an antenna. It's uh, Saturday afternoon here in Ottawa, Canada, and I can hear a few CW stations on 40 meters. I'm using these amplified speakers for this video since the radio can only directly drive headphones. To receive, you set the band and adjust the pre-selector for a peak. Adjust AF gain and RF gain as desired. As mentioned, tuning from high end to low end can help ensure that you're on the right frequency when transmitting.
The receiver is quite sensitive and the selectivity is pretty good for CW work. I rarely use the narrow filter setting unless there's QRM from a nearby station. There's no automatic gain control, so you typically have to turn the RF gain down for strong signals to avoid distortion. There's no receiver incremental tuning, so moving the tuning dial will change your transmit and receive frequency. So any kind of split frequency operation is not feasible with this rig. The offset is fixed at about 750 hertz. The HW8 was the most popular QRP rig that Heathkit made. People have published various modifications for the HW8 over the years, either to improve performance or add new features. Mine is original with no mods, and I generally prefer to keep these units mostly original, only doing what's needed to keep them working. By today's standards, the HW8 is lacking in performance and features, but it can still be fun to fire it up and see what QSOs you can make with it. It's easy to maintain as it was a kit and most components are still obtainable. And you don't need to read a manual just to figure out how to turn it on like some of today's modern DSP controlled rigs. As I record this in March 2013, there's still snow here in Ottawa, Canada. Once the warmer weather arrives, I hope to try this rig out for some portable operation outdoors. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please check out my other YouTube videos on vintage amateur radio and test equipment.